you have arrived at your destination. Hey guys, before we get started, let me tell you about the most innovative approach to new music that exists today. Revival Recordings, an artist-first record label based out of North Carolina, has introduced Revival 52, a commitment to fans to release new music every Friday for all 52 weeks of 2018. From metal to pop punk to indie rock, Revival 52 will bring something new for you to enjoy every Friday. And right now, Revival is giving away a free Amazon Echo to one lucky fan once they hit 1,000 followers on their Revival 52. To Spotify playlist. Just go to ffm.to slash revival52 and follow the playlist to enter. Enjoy great music from your new favorite record label for free right now. Revival 52 on Spotify. That's right, Wildlings. You wanted the best. You got the best. The hottest podcast in Louisville, Kentucky, the Sean vs. Wild podcast. I'm your host, as always, the man, the myth, the Sean Thriller Smith, the guy putting Rad back into talk radio. And guys, it's time to rock and roll all night and podcast every Tuesday. Hopefully, you guys had an awesome Memorial Day weekend, three days off in a row to recharge those batteries, three days off away from work. That's always great. Fun in the sun, you know what I'm saying? Hopefully you guys had the grills going. Hopefully you guys swam uh, in the pool, took a dip in the pool, and hopefully you guys waited 30 minutes in between eating and getting in the pool, man, because you'll get cramps, and who wants that on Memorial Day? Let's be honest here. (laughs) Guys, it was a hot one this weekend. It was uh, very hot, uh, as a matter of fact. I went up to the Indy 500. I was hanging out with Thor and Dead Mouse and, uh, you know, Elio Castroneves, uh, but I was the sweatiest guy maybe at the Indy 500 that was my claim to fame this year guys uh very sweaty very hot and I came back looking rather red like a lobster so gotta love that guys I'm looking so cool here in the Smithsonian this morning uh but yeah Guys, hopefully you didn't forget the reason for the season. Big shout out to all of those that have served or know someone that has served there uh, in the in the military there. Thank you for keeping us free and all that good sort of thing. We definitely appreciate it there. Thank you for your service. And guys, I'm going to continue on uh, with this America theme today on the podcast. I'm going to cut you off a slice of Americana. This week, I'm talking to Nick Dittmeyer. You guys know him from Nick Dittmeyer and the Sawdusters. We're going to be talking about his form of uh, Americana folk alternative country here, uh, how he got interested in it. We're going to be talking about the backstory of uh, how he got into music and uh, and stuff like that. We're going to be talking about our favorite uh, parts of VH1's Behind the Music. It may be crass and crude at times, but you know what, guys? This is my show. If you don't like it, get your own show where you just talk about the good stuff about VH1's Behind the Music. And also, guys, you wanted it. You got it. I'm not going to disappoint you. We're even going to be talking about Suburban Blood Drive. The band Nick and I uh, were in together over a decade ago. So, yeah, we're definitely going to be hitting you with all that good sort of thing. You're not going to want to miss that. And uh, yeah, guys, I'll tell you what, this is one of the cool things about this podcast. I want to give a big shout out to Nick because really Nick and I have not really talked maybe just a few times in the last decade or so. And uh, when we came over to record this, you know, it was like we were old friends again. And uh, afterwards, we just kind of have kept on texting each other and we send each other uh, awesome YouTube videos of, you know, like... Uh, lit <laughs> playing at an outdoor festival and uh, Scott Stapp singing the national anthem somewhere. Uh, but yeah, man, it's like able to rekindle a friendship. So that's a cool thing about this podcast, man. Just one of the many reasons why I love it so much. So yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. And speaking of things that I love, I love my sponsors and uh, I got to be talking about them right now. How about Audible? Uh, Audible is going to give you a free 30 day trial of their service. You guys know them. It's an Amazon company. You get your audio books from them. And uh, just for listening to the Sean vs. Wild podcast, you're going to get a free 30-day trial of Audible. Simply go to audibletrial.com slash Sean vs. Wild. audibletrial.com slash Sean vs. Wild. Sign up for your free 30 days. And uh, when you do, they're going to give me a little cash money. That helps the show. That keeps the show going. Keeps the lights on here at the Smithsonian, guys. Um, and then also, too, big shout out to Audiophile Inc. Shane at Audiophile Inc. has got all of your screen printing needs taken care of. All the Sean vs. Wild merch. All the Uh-huh Baby Yeah merch. All the Suburban Blood Drive merch from back in the day that is still holding up. I've seen those shirts out there still. 
tell you what, those are all printed by Shane. He's got some quality work, and he can do the same for you. Just go to audiophileinc.com and tell him the wild man sent you. Place your order for your T-shirts, your your uh, tank tops because it's so hot, your track shorts, whatever it is that you want. Audiophileinc.com has got you covered. A-U-D-I-O-P-H-I-L-E-I-N-K.com. And again, tell him the wild man sent you. And uh, also, big shout out, of course, to my producer, my good friend, Joseph Brock. He's going to be booping the dials this week, as he has done for almost 80 weeks in a row. I've definitely kept him busy, sometimes more than one episode a week. So, Joe, thank you so much for all that you do. Make me, making me sound like $100 here. And guys, thanks so much for listening. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe if you haven't. Tell a friend about the podcast. I'm trying to grow these numbers up big time. Uh, refer a friend, man, if you enjoy it. Or you know what? Just shout out to me if you do enjoy it. Tell me what you like about it. I want to know that you're listening to these intros. Um, but yeah, let's get some dialogue going. And uh, I got a lot of free swag that I want to give away too. So maybe if you uh, drop me a review, something like that on iTunes, uh, I'll send some free stuff your way also uh yeah just hit me up sean versus wild at gmail.com or i'm also on facebook twitter uh instagram whatever i'm on all social media platforms so if you reach out to me chances are i'm going to be getting back to you pretty quickly because i don't really have a, a big social life <laughs> not gonna lie outside of this podcast so yeah again thanks so much for checking it out guys that's enough from me hope you had a happy and safe memorial day weekend now let's get wild <laughs> Yeah, before we get started, I have to crack open a cold Budweiser Select 55, you know, because sometimes you just got to watch your carbs. You know how it is, don't you? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> have you ever had Bud Select 55? Uh, no, no, I haven't had. Bud's, well, no. I'll tell you what. Someone asked me, like, dude, how are they, man? I'm like, well, if you want to drink a lot of beers, not get drunk and wake up with the worst <laughs> headache of your life. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I assume it's pretty watered down tasting. Like, oh, it's just yeah. water. Yeah, basically. Yeah. It kind of tastes like water and apple juice. Yeah. Like if you were to water it down even more, that's yeah. basically kind of what it tastes like. Well, if you could weather 40 more calories, then you could just have like a Bud Light or a PBR yeah. or something. Miller Light, like 96 yeah. cals, bro. Yeah. So, but you know what? Uh, you know, I got to do it for the low carbs. Got to keep my carbs in check. Yeah. Doing the keto. Oh, you're doing keto? Yeah. I heard that makes you nuts, man. <laughs> heard it makes you crazy. Well, I, <laughs> even better for the podcast. Like you'll just see my slow decline into <laughs> craziness. Yeah, uh, as the as the episodes go by. Yeah, I don't really know how it works. Uh, I know it has to do with uh, like ketoacidosis. Also, is that what the, the it's about being in ketosis? Yeah, so you basically eat like high fats and no carbs or extremely low carbs, and you got to keep your protein in check. Okay, so basically you just eat things that. Will probably make you thin, but also probably clog your arteries by the time you're like 45. All right. So you could eat a Big Mac, but no bun. Right. Okay. Exactly. Because that's where all the bad stuff lies. <laughs> right there in the McDonald's bun. <laughs> or McRib. No bun. That, that's fancier. You yeah. eat with a fork and knife. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, look at yeah. me. I'm going out for ribs. Were you going to Texas Roadhouse? <laughs> no, I'm going to McDonald's. Yeah. I'm going to get the McRib. It's yeah. back. It's back. So. It's, they only do it a few times a year because it sells out so fast. Yeah, it's a special occasion. It's like Christmas. Yeah. For fast food, you know. But you know there's a reason why they only do it once a year. Did you know the reason why they only do McRib once a year? Why? Uh because it like so uh, like a, a a research scientist, I think it was at either Nebraska or Iowa State somewhere, he, he had a grant to like a corporate grant to um to use like pork products like the all the you know, the snouts and the butts and everything and uh, so that's what the McRib is. And so they do it in the fall because that's when the pork prices are the cheapest. So oh. it's the cheapest pork. Plus, and it, and if you they, were to eat it all year round, you'd probably die. Yeah. Well, it's like got the fake bones in it too. You know, yeah. like it's supposed to look like ribs, but it, yeah, no it's no bones. It's just like, ribbed for your dining pleasure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I wonder if it scared people when – because, I mean, the McRib would have come out – I mean – 80s probably? A, yeah, 80s, 90s. whatever it was going to be. And – I just kind of wonder if people thought they were biting into bones, maybe. I'm not sure. Oh, man. It's like a hot dog. (laughs) It's like a rib-like hot dog. (laughs) Exactly. You're going to love it, man. It's Like, you like ribs? You like hot dogs? Wait till you try this. (laughs) It's going to be an unknown product, but it's going to be covered in barbecue sauce. So Yeah. Much like the Z-Rib at school. Do you remember the Z-Rib? Z-Rib on bun. That's what it was read on the... uh, on, on the, the on the menu at school, like juice, fruit juice, or milk, or whatever. yeah, dude. If you're if you were ever in uh, Dip Meyer, um, sorry, New Myers Telecommunications class, 
you'd have to read the lunch menu and like oh, today oh, yeah, yeah. Z rib on bun, green beans, fruit or juice, <laughs> cookie, and of course milk. Milk. I was telling somebody the story of the day about when I was in school. Like I feel like like I need to go through like a twelve step program for being a being an asshole like and and rick newmeyer would be one person that would be the top of the list that i would apologize to yeah but, the first person you call up <laughs> to forgive like i didn't do drugs i didn't do alcohol i was just a fucking sociopath for a good portion of my life and so but uh i remember man at school like in elementary school they we had field day and they told us they were gonna have milkshakes at the uh, after after field day, so we got back to the cafeteria, and all the lunch ladies did was just they just froze milk, like white milk, like and they just gave it to us with like a spoon, like just a, you know, and we were like the kids just fucking revolted, man, like but it was bullshit. <laughs> it was a walkout, <laughs> <laughs> like just shouting at the lunch ladies, you know, like a little mob, you know, of of people. Yeah, kids know? these days they walk out for gun control, and kids <laughs> those days walk out because you got frozen milk, not a milkshake. <laughs> Right. False advertisement, guys. That is kind of fucked up to do to some kids or anybody to pass it off as a milkshake. That's just milk. Yeah, why don't you just tell them we're going to have cold milk yeah. after your... <laughs> like frozen milk. Yeah. <laughs> it's a school. We're yeah. poor. What the right. fuck are you going to do about it? Hey, guys, uh, after this field day, we'll have... Well, I mean... Freeze imagine the milk. Yes, yeah. freeze the milk. You're going to love this. <laughs> what a cool treat for such a hot day. Right. <laughs> but guys, this isn't just the school lunch podcast. This is also the Sean versus Wild podcast. And I'm sitting here with an old pal I cannot wait to catch up with. I'm talking to Nick Dittmeyer. You guys know him from Nick Dittmeyer and the Saw dusters and you might remember a little band called a suburban blood drive from back in the day and nick and i were both in it and honestly i probably haven't talked to you it really sat down and had a good face to face with you in about a decade yeah so i'm I'm stoked to make this thing happen right on man thank you for joining me today (laughs) it's gonna be like npr we'll just whisper into the microphone (laughs) but yeah dude so uh well what for one, let's go ahead. Let's start with this with the Sawdusters, brother, because that thing is uh, you guys are picking up big time uh, here. So, uh, what have you been up to? Uh, I've been living in a van for the last three or so years um, with you know a front a band, country band, my singer songwriter project called Nick Dittmeyer and the Sawdusters, and uh, we released like three record two EP well under my name two EPs and then a full length and then we've got another full length that's coming out in October but we've just stayed on tour like everything in the United States basically east of Denver we might have gone west further in Texas but just basically that half of the United States we haven't gone we haven't gone fur, further west what are your but, favorite what are some of your favorite markets to play well we've hit, we've hit Texas a lot and I like Texas um because the cities are just you know on I35 go, I35 goes from like Minneapolis Minnesota to Mexico and so there's a, like Dallas, Austin, Fort Worth, New Braunfels, Denton, uh, San Antonio. All those cities are on 35. And there's just kind of a, a good infrastructure for bands, especially the kind of music we do in Texas, where for a small band that, that doesn't have much of a fan base in Texas at this point, um, for us to get in and showcase and actually be compensated well for it, you know, right. and be taken care of and, and feeling like – what you're there to do is valued. Um, I do like Texas a lot. And then we're headed to Colorado. I've, I've did another, I did a run through Colorado before it's been about a year and a half and I'm excited to get there. And then we've, uh, we've had like a lot of luck in the, uh, like the Northern Midwest, like super far upper Midwest, like Michigan and, and, uh, Wisconsin stuff. There's a lot of, um, like appetite for Americana country music, you know, underground country music and, and, uh, and then also I like going to the rural northeast. Like the, we've gone the back way through like upstate New York, Vermont, um, and and those. It, it's totally different than like the coastal northeast. Um, so. Have you ever made it up to Maine? I've never gone that far. No, that's uh, so I'm missing three states. I would have. Uh, I've been to 48. Or I'm sorry, 47. Man, that math. It's the butt select 55, yeah. <laughs> bro. I'm blaming it on there, on that. Uh, so 47 out of the 50 states: Maine, Alaska, Hawaii. The only ones I've not been to. Yeah. So Maine's scary though, dude. Dude, Stephen King, brother. Yeah, yeah I've seen Pet Cemetery. <laughs> I've seen Pet Cemetery. I know what goes on in those roads. Yeah, those rods. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bad rod, Lars. Yeah. <laughs> uh, dude, Texas is fantastic. I remember uh, going there. We played South by Southwest there. Have you ever had an opportunity to uh, do South by Southwest? We've never messed with it, man. Uh, to be honest with you, um, I've never even submitted the showcase for it. I think I did years and years ago, um, mm-hmm. but I'd, 
I, I mean, I know we can go play Austin whenever we want. So right. it's kind of like, I don't really want to go through the fight through the traffic. And yeah, all that kind of stuff. I want to play Austin when everyone's there. <laughs> I want to pay $400 to park five miles away. Yeah, that's what I've heard the parking is. is yeah, well it's over. abysmal. But we played, just talking about being very handsomely compensated for your work, we played uh, this place called, I want to say it was called the, Ch- okay, I know exactly what it's called, the Chuggin' Monkey. Okay. So big shout out to the Chuggin' Monkey, Austin, <laughs> Texas. We played there in 20, I want to say 14 was the first year we played and like the the whole place just kind of packed out when we were playing it was loud it was like you know we put on like a pretty big show and then the owner was just like man you guys are awesome like here have some drink tickets come to see come see me whenever you know you run out and this was at like noon and literally we hit this dude up for drink tickets until like 10 11 p.m. <laughs> Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> yeah. And uh, no, but... We, central time. Yeah, Central Time. Yeah. But yeah, we partied like like it was nobody's business. And they just kept giving it to us, man. All those Lone Star beers. Oh, hell yeah, man. Yeah. So that's my jam. I got to have Lone Star or Tecate if I'm in Texas. Yeah, I go Shiner, ah, actually. That's you, another good one. You can get a lot of other... Um, the ones they don't sell up here too, they're you know, India is kind of limited with the Shiner, but yeah, dude, they're holding this, they're holding out on it. Dude. It's like the McRib, man. You can only have Shiner just at certain times of the year. It's stingy. Yeah, <laughs> but dude, let's take it back because you've actually been one of the most requested guests on this podcast. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> that kind of makes me laugh. <laughs> so many people are like, "You got to get Nick Dittmeyer, man." And a lot of people want to know what you're like. You know, they want to hear about um, all the the good stuff, the old stuff, and everything that you're doing now. I, when I had Brian Whiteman from Emmanuel on the podcast, that was kind of like what sparked it. They're like, "Man, you had somebody from Emmanuel talking about Emmanuel. You got to have Nick. You got to have like or Devin or somebody come up and talk about old times too." So I figure, let's go ahead. Let's not focus on it, but let's just take a walk down memory lane. Okay, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't remember a lot. Like, yeah, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Neither do I. <laughs> well, just for the sake of um, like where I was mentally, you know, like what was fueling a lot of my decision making, like not from a, I don't remember because I was drunk, more of a, I don't remember a lot of my motivations. I would put it that way. Yeah. Not to mention, you know, here we are in 2018 and we're talking 2002 and 2003. 2004, 2005 would have been. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah. So, uh, well, let's talk, well, the super group, let's bring it back, man. Okay. Cause uh, you know, uh, for a, for you, man, when I watch you play, I always think that you're like one of just the most well versed, well trained guitarists that I've ever seen play. Because I remember, you know, you're playing rock music and then more jazzy stuff, and then heavier stuff, and then now you're doing like a southern and country and alt country and all this other kind of thing. But back in the day, I remember going to Devin's basement with Ryan Davis, checking out a new band called the Super Group. You, Devin, Pat, and some other guy that I don't remember. Okay, all right. And uh, I remember hearing, uh, there goes your Juliet. Okay. <laughs> do you remember this at all? Does it yeah, just yeah, I, do, yeah I, I vaguely do. I don't know if any of those songs or CDs exist or anything. I don't know if any of the CDs exist. I just happen to remember that song specifically. I think it might have even been a tape, actually. <laughs> I don't know well if it even made it to CD format. I think I got an MP3, which I think it was... How just long did it take you to download? <laughs> like 15 minutes. On a, on a 21.6 modem. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Didn't even have 56K at the time. Yeah. And then, uh, and then we played, you know, back in my two for flinching days, we played with the super group many a time. Yeah. So to give context to anyone listening, it was the very, very, very first, uh, band I ever played in. And I was 16. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then that band later, uh, became uh, like the, the kind of core of people were people that I just kept making music with into my early twenties, um, that took on different uh me you know different types of music i guess different but, avenues bro yeah yeah we evolved together and especially me and devin um evolved uh musically together you know i mean i i knew him since kindergarten so um we you know in think three years you know we were in the same band together yeah yeah, and you guys is like I think you guys really uh, helped each other evolve as far as the quality of your playing goes because both of you guys are fantastic guitarists as well. And I feel like did you guys have the same teacher? Or yeah, maybe? we did actually. Uh, okay. He was a professor uh, at Bellarmine. Um, yeah, so he was actually my dad's guitar teacher. He played for Marvin Gaye, and then um, he played with Howard Roberts, who 
it's probably like the most recorded guitar player ever. Um, Howard Roberts, like all the 60s TV theme songs, like the Munsters and, and stuff. So he actually had that dude's guitar. He, Howard Roberts started the Guitar Institute of Technology in uh, L.A., and this dude was kind of like a disciple of Howard. Too. Oh, that's awesome. So, but yeah, we did. Um, but like I always wanted to be like a good guitar player because I thought like I had some spare time. And if I could get okay at it, it was one less person I had to hire to do it, you right. know, or find to do it. Like even what I'm doing now, I mean, a lot of people in the, the genre don't want to take on doing a lot of lead guitar and singing, but like I kind of ha- I had to do it, you know, I right. felt like it elim- eliminated a degree of risk. It certainly makes yeah. it much easier. It, it certainly adds a total degree of convenience Correct, to what yeah. you're doing. Cause like, you know, me as a drummer and me not really branching out and learning too many, you know, just kind of being able to kind of noodle around, if you will, on a, on a guitar or something. Like if I wanted to start a band and write songs, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to write a song unless it was like, here's a drum part. And I'm thinking, right. you're just going to come in with some <laughs> shredding, you know, whatever. Like I, all I could do would be able to, would be to give notes and I got to find somebody else to play the music. Yeah. So yeah. that would be a challenge. Yeah. Right. So that's why I do podcasting now Yeah. because now I just, for the same reason, it's so much more convenient where I just rely on myself and yeah. then get, get a guest to come in. But, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> and if I can't get a guess, I'll just talk to uh, the listeners myself. Yeah. So, yeah. And then from the super group uh, became uh, a suburban blood drive. But you guys were kind of like, I don't know, like a rock jazz kind of like. Remember that band like Jazz June that was here kind yeah. of thing? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. that sort of thing. And that's, again, um, 2004 ish, I would say. Yeah. Well, no, it would have been way before that. Because I, I think I, I have to think about this all the time. But. I graduated high school in 2003. So uh, 2004, 2005 would have been like the suburban blood drive people would have actually have known. Um, right. So uh, somewhere somewhere in that. That would be you, Pat, Devin, and old Derek Arnold. N- no, no. That would have been like me, you. Who else was well, I'm talking about in oh. your jazz days. Oh. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So with yeah, old yeah. Derek Arnold. And then uh, you guys became way heavier and the suburban blood drive that I think everyone knows and remembers. And uh, yeah. And then Cody joined the band. Yeah, Cody. Fuck yeah. I remember. Oh, I was trying to think who else played in that band. <laughs> um, uh, uh, me, Devin, Cody, and you was basically the last yeah, okay. uh, formation of the group. And actually I saw a video on YouTube. I was, this is going to be hilarious. You just got to see it because, um, I was looking up some old ASBD stuff. We're all talking about it. We're having some beers over here at the Smithsonian. And, um, I I look it up on YouTube and some, somebody is cool enough to have like uploaded some of the demos or some of the uh, CDs and stuff that we had handed out, you know, Armageddon, Armageddon on, uh, Armageddon on never really surfaced, but some people have, that thing floating around on yeah. YouTube now. Uh-huh. And uh, one of the videos is of Cody flying a plane. Yeah. Because you know, he's know a pilot now. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then like he's just flying a plane, listening to Suburban Blood Drive. And then it's just like, fuck this room and everybody in it. And he's just like pointing to this lady that he's like flying. <laughs> it's fantastic. I, I have to look this up. Man. Oh, man. It was great. Yeah. It blew my mind. I'm like, I cannot believe this is online. I can't believe this is on the internet. But uh, Cody Williams for the win on that one. Wow. And then uh, bodies, of course. Uh huh. And uh, I remember that from the my. See, that was kind of uh, that was like the MySpace period because I remember specifically bodies having a, a, a MySpace. And I remember listening to uh, a couple tracks on like the EP that was on MySpace. Okay. All right. Yeah, dude. When was the last time you thought about that? Well, I was uh, in one of the guys that played in the Sawdusters. It's not with us anymore. He. Uh, he actually got one of the CDs out of my basement and like listened to it and stuff and liked it and like showed it to some of his friends. So I don't think it's, it's probably not horrible. It's probably, you know, tolerable. Um, you know, I've, I've, I think it was last summer when I was doing some solo shows and at night when I was driving and stuff, I was listening to back to some stuff that I hadn't heard in a long time. And a lot of it, I mean, a lot of it to me, the heavy music and stuff that I liked then I think holds up pretty well, you know? Um, but, uh, I think it's, not horribly embarrassing. Yeah, know? I mean it's for it's me, pretty solid, or, you know, for what it is. Yeah, there's nothing worse than when you look back on some of the demos, like, and you're just like super embarrassed. You're like, oh man. But the thing is, is everything that you do gets you to where you are now, right? Yeah, of course. You know, mm-hmm. what kind of music? Just to kind of go off topic, and I'll I'll get us back on topic. But 
you know, you're talking about the heavier music that you listen to. Do you still listen to any of that anymore? What do you listen to now? Like, what's on your playlist now? Uh, I don't really listen to very much heavy music, but I mean, I listen to a lot of like, uh, I still like a lot of punk music and like 80s punk, you know, um, and then like a lot of like 90s stuff too. Um, but I mean, my listening goes all over the place. Like today, um, what were we listening to? Like Loud and Wainwright the Third, and then some Tony Joe White. And then there's um, the new Sarah Shook and the Disarmers record I was listening to. I'm trying to think what else we were listening to today, but. Um, like Los Lobos, I listen to them a lot. Um, I remember Los Lobos. Every morning they would play a commercial for Rad Rockers Against Drunk Driving. Did they really? Yeah. So there was like a commercial that used to come on, like the Fox Forty One Kids Club or something okay. like that, yeah. and uh, it would just be for about Rad, and they would play La Bamba, and then all of a sudden they like at the end they would just go, "This is Los Lobos for Rad." <laughs> <laughs> Did <laughs> they really? Yeah, yeah, that's the first time I ever knew who Los Lobos was, and then. I saw La Bamba and then yeah. it was over with. So I was like, yeah, oh. that was the only hit they have. The, the the actual band doesn't really sound anything like that. Like they're a really cool band, but yeah, that was the their brush with a commercial success. But um, well, they did the entire soundtrack to the movie yeah. La Bamba. And, and have too. you watched that movie recently? Oh my god, yes, I have. Okay, because <laughs> I have a very soft spot in my heart for those eighties. Uh, like rock biopics, like oh, yeah. the one with uh, Dennis Quaid as uh, Jerry Lewis. Oh, Great Balls of Fire. Yeah, I love that. I have There's it on one, VHS. Who does the Buddy Holly one? Uh, Gary Busey. Gary Busey's Buddy Holly. Buddy and, Holly story. And then there was uh, some really good made for TV ones, like the Michael Jackson. They're the Jackson yeah, story. American Dream. Yeah, yeah. I loved uh, La Bamba, and yes, dude, and Isai Morales is. So good. The guy that plays Bob, yeah. Richie's brother. He's like, he's like, it's not my first <laughs> or my last. Dude, yeah. the ultimate scumbag, Bob. If you guys want to see a classic, I don't know, just guy make terrible mistakes and be totally unapologetic about it, go and watch La Bamba. Richie! <laughs> like the- Richie! <laughs> Dude, uh, me and John Brayboy um, used to quote La Bamba like religiously. Yeah. So that was just like our movie that we always quoted. But yeah, I love that. They're like, Bob, I'm pregnant. He goes, it's okay. It's not my first or my last. <laughs> yeah. And he's like shit face drunk, I think. Yeah. Too. yeah. When this is or like whenever they're playing in Tijuana and they're like playing Oh Boy by Buddy Holly. He's just back on the drums going, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah the, the band in the scenes where Richie's like up and coming, like doesn't remotely really sync up or make any sense. But that's why the movie like Walk Hard is so good too, because it just accumulates all the weird stuff of, and even some weird VH1 stuff too from like the 90 they would do some biopics like they do like a rick nielsen one i don't know if you remember this one it was really weird yeah or like, like behind the music they'd always just the, do, do, they're all on youtube actually if you ever want to go down a, a dark oh i would love to yeah. i loved behind the music that was oh, my yeah. absolute favorite what was your favorite behind the music um i would say uh personally i would say maybe the motley crew one. i was because <laughs> the part where he kills his friend <laughs> oh my god <laughs> we're laughing about that he's like, like raz he's like i see raz's sneaker or whatever what does he yeah, say he's like i saw uh raz's <laughs> sneaker on the side of the road and, and like, then bro what happened like, yeah just the- and then like vince neal's like trying to like fucking make excuses all the time like he's just like yeah i was like shifting and like there was water i'm like it's probably because you were shit face plastered <laughs> and going to the liquor store driving 100 miles an hour yeah. in a ferrari or whatever yeah so or you know not to go on a dark, <laughs> dark tangent of laughing at misfortunes but the metallica behind the music oh, God. and you just hear kirk hammond he's go the black ice like, yeah <laughs> he was like yeah oh yeah jason uh jason he says like i didn't see any black or yeah uh, james hatfield james yeah. hatfield like i didn't see any black <laughs> yeah and uh but yeah like you just kirk hammond's like you could hear everyone screaming except for cliff <laughs> he's like they lifted up the bus <laughs> and then they dropped the bus back down on cliff oh my god dude yeah. uh well actually my favorite though okay so <laughs> that got dark but uh also hilarious. Well, dude. The, okay, so behind the music and and because it was dark, pretty bottom of the barrel. Because uh, for because I mean, you got to think about this. Like back then, in like you think about like, all the eighties metal behind the music. Like there could be. I mean, the light could go off on your career like that. Oh and yeah. And it went off for a lot of those people. You know, like Kev, um, uh, the Quiet Riot one. Yeah, with Kevin DeBro. Yeah, who's dead now was died living with his mother. But like these bands fell on some really bad hard times. You know and and they just, you know, but now, even with the 80s hair metal bands, I mean, it's like, the, that just doesn't happen the same way, where you're just written off, like, within a year, you know? Right. You're in an arena, or have a number one song, and then within an album or two, you're fucking finished, you know? Um, my favorite one was the Leonard Skinner one, but that was just because, as yeah, I was, you know, 
12 right, yeah. and a Leonard Skinner fan. But the Leif Garrett one where he meets the guy who he crippled. Oh, my god! He used to meet him in a park. He's like, how you doing, man? He's like, how you doing? And he's just like, dude, you <laughs> saved my life. <laughs> And he like got so much catharsis. <laughs> Why are we laughing at the worst parts of <laughs> the music? You know, it's like oh, because yeah, and Lift Gear's wearing like a, a bandana. Yeah, because he definitely and sweatpants. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. Uh, or I'm trying to think of some other highlights. Uh, here's here's the most depressing highlight, not from uh, behind the music, but from uh, similar. Did I'm sure. Uh, you watched E True Hollywood Story, right? I've seen a lot of them, yeah. Yeah, so like basically E True Hollywood Story, guys. If you don't remember what uh, what that is, it's like the Hollywood equivalent of behind the music. They talk about people that had promising careers, and then it goes on to hard times. But uh, the one with Corey Haim, okay, and like there's like a scene at the end, like they're just talking about what Corey Haim does now, and it's like Corey Haim is now working on his music, and it shows him like in this apartment that has no furniture in it, on like a like 25 key Casio keyboard, <laughs> like just goofing. Like Corey around. Haim or Corey Feldman? Corey Haim. Okay. All right. RIP. He's since, okay. we, since left us as well. But like, it's just like, and he spends time working on his music and he's just like fiddling on some keys on this small toy keyboard. And uh, that was one of those scenes that always stuck with me. I'm like, oh man, that's hilariously depressing. Yeah. We're laughing at their misfortunes. But you know what? They had a, they had a life. Yeah. So. More power to him. What are you gonna do? <laughs> what are you gonna do, guys? Hopefully, we don't end up on behind the music. We'll end up on behind the music, and you guys can laugh at us. Okay? Yeah, you can laugh at my bit. But there was okay. So just to, 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 to kind of cut this off, though, there was behind the music, which was like a roll of the dice for whatever these people were like, or what had happened to them, or what they'd been through. Like you know, there was a Ted Nugent one that talked about how gay kids weren't allowed at his bow and arrow camp or oh something. Oh my god, I make my own beef jerky. <laughs> 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 yeah, like that's uh, like how edgy he is, and then uh, and then, but then they had the the Legend series, so they'd like a Bruce Springsteen one, oh, yeah. Grateful Dead, and those were actually really well made music documentaries. They had a Led Zeppelin one, or like that kind of was the line in the sand for like certain acts. You know, I, was, I also loved classic albums. The VH1 had classic albums, and basically they would just pick an album like uh, like Meatloaf, Bad Out of Hell, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'd I have like Meatloaf this. in the studio, but they'd actually. Uh, you know, cue up the original tapes and like he'll be at the board, like mm-hmm. soloing some stuff. I'm like, oh, you could hear the drums and the keyboard part and blah, 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 blah. And like talking about how they did all that, all that sort of thing. And that was kind of cool from like a production and mm-hmm. just like from a music making standpoint. But yeah, VH1, man, we went down that rabbit hole. Big time. Yeah, dude, I miss VH1 so much pop up video and, you know, that's when it's good now. Like, Jeopardy. I mean, now I get it. Like you can get on YouTube and watch any video you want anytime you want, but. Sometimes it's nice to just have a show on that just plays videos at random, and you might find something new right. that you never would have imagined, and you had no choice but to watch it, or you had to get up and change the station. So, yeah, that is how it was, guys, back in the day. <laughs> now you have YouTube. You don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but yeah, um, and then also too, uh, just to get back on on topic of music, because back when you were listening or when we were you know playing like in Suburban Blood Drive and like the heavier stuff. You and I were talking about how much we loved country music. Yeah, we were. We grew up on '80s, '90s country music, right? Um, and it's kind of funny though, but it's like now you know in Louisville now there's like 1039 or whatever. It's like there are '90s. They call it like true country. Yeah, or true like, country. So that a lot of that was. I mean, my parents just well, like you know they, you know, had tapes and you know we're always listening to WAMZ or you know whatever. Um, got to listen to 107.7, The Hawk. You listen, you're a Hawk fan? <laughs> I was more of an AMZ guy. Oh, but, gotcha. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I I mean, I always liked... Uh, well, also, too, at that music. time, country music was outselling rock and roll. I mean, Garth Brooks was the number one selling artist of the 90s. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Outselling Michael Jackson and everything else, the Titanic soundtrack or whatever, <laughs> you know, whatever else huge... Blues Traveler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, the hook didn't quite uh, bring it all the way back to number one. Uh, but yeah, so... But that's yeah. I grew up with Garth Brooks, uh, Travis Tritt, uh, Randy Travis, yeah, Vince um, Gill, Alabama, would yeah, have been Shenandoah, Dwight Diamond Rio, <laughs> Alan Jackson, yeah. You know, and uh, a good friend of mine. His name's. Do you know Levi? I don't know if I know. Really. He's he's got hair down to his ass. He's very metal. He was in Order of Leviathan. Now he sings for God King. But uh, you know, he's real into metal. But I told him I like country music, and immediately we bonded and like. Stayed over here, like he did a podcast, and then he just stayed over, and we just drank beers till like three in the morning, mm-hmm. watching, you know, classic country on YouTube. Yeah, but it was great then, and I think that it's just 
now the alt music, and maybe this is just my opinion, but like alt music and indie stuff, people love the country music they grew up on, but they need something that isn't what country music is now. You like know, currently on the radio, is that right? Yeah, which is basically just like southern rock, ultra produced with like it's just basically pop music with like a banjo in it. Sometimes, yeah. Um, I don't know though, but like you know. You, like Shania Twain, like in the nineties was kind of like that too, in a sense, you know, where like she was considered, uh, so pop and like it outraged a lot of people. But if you listen to a lot of those songs now, like they're pretty innocuous country songs, you know? I yeah. Mean, I but, feel like a woman. <laughs> yeah. But, Scoo-doo. but it was different kind of, you know, Def Leppard style production on some of those country songs, but well, thanks Mutt Lang, <laughs> you know, Hey, here's a tidbit. The guy, the same guy that, you know, produced Shania Twain did produce Def Leppard. True. Yeah. And I think she and married him. Did he not? Did she? Yeah. Not? He cheated on her. Oh man. Yeah. Man, he pulled a Def Leppard on her, dude. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'd give my left arm to play drums in Def Leppard. <laughs> Zing. Anyway, but Hey, I'll tell you what, since we're talking about country, since we're on a roll here, um, I feel like w- Let's go ahead and uh, give everyone a taste of the Sawdusters, and then we'll hit the Sawdusters hard on uh, the second half of the show here. So you have prepared a piece. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's here in studio right now, guys. You cannot believe the quality of this. Uh, but no, uh, we're going to drop in a song here, and uh, let's see here. It looks like it's going to be Just My Job. Give everyone the deets. What's the background on Just My Job? Uh, it's, um, it was off our last record and it's a song about, um, uh, like moral ambivalence, uh, like having to do things that you don't, you kind of know are wrong, but you kind of are forced to do those things. Like a mafia hitman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or just like going to work, pushing paper all day, yes. you know, like, Hey, this office shit is dumb, but yep. I better do it. Yep. So I can get that money. Totally. I feel that. I think anybody can relate to that. But yeah, let's go ahead and give it a listen, guys. This is Nick Dittmeyer and the Sawdusters with Just My Job. All the coach trucks come back quarter to five. Grab our gear. Head down in the mine. Don't think about it much. It's just my job. 
Everybody, that was Nick Dittmeyer and the Sawdusters taking you to Toontown with just my job. <laughs> you like that? Toontown? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I like Toontown. <laughs> I like that. I was a big Roger Rabbit fan. Me back too. In the have, day. You, have you watched that movie recently? Like gone back and watched it? I haven't watched it recently. I probably watched it maybe seven or eight years ago was the first time. I think it's still on Netflix. It's a good. It's a good one. It holds up. Oh, Bob Hoskins, dude. Yeah, R.I.P. R.I.P. Did you know that Bob Hoskins was the uh Original first choice to play Wolverine in X Men in the nineties. Yes, no, I didn't know that. That's yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. But yeah. apparently, well, like Wolverine in the comic books are, is like five feet tall and like real gruff. Oh, okay. So like Bob Hoskins is like got a short, stocky build, and uh, yeah. But instead, they went with some guy named Hugh Jackman, uh, and maybe you've heard of him <laughs> instead. But yeah, and we had a great conversation while we were on the, the break. About how much we, uh, how heated we be, we can get at fast food. Yeah, no, I heated. I try not to get. <laughs> yes, basically. I try not to be. Yeah, and Hardee's being, we also came to the conclusion that Hardee's is definitely the worst if you if you're in a hurry and you want to get. F- it's the fast bottom food. of the barrel fast food restaurant because they do the hamburger with the hot dog and the chips on it too. <laughs> Have you seen that one? No. All the they do it in the summer for Fourth of July. They call it like the All American Burger. Dude, it's, they it's put a, a hot dog on the burger. Well, they cut it. They, they they slice it down the middle. They bisect it. They, they uh, yeah, they, uh, yeah. And then they, there's like Lay's potato chips on it. What, what to, uh, to you, what is the best fast food if you had to pick? Like if you, if there's like one burger or one thing and you're like, this is probably going to be my number one fighting champion in a tournament <laughs> of burgers. Uh, I um, probably in and out. That's what I would go with. But but it's also a point of the fact that I only get to eat it like a couple times a year. Yeah, so know? it's special. So, yeah, where normally you're kind of forced into eating fast food. You yeah, know? to me the Dairy Queen Flamethrower Burger <laughs> is the, my champion burger. Is can you get? Is that limited edition? Oh no, it's not limited edition. It's an everyday uh, treat. Okay. Okay. I never, th- I never think to go to Dairy Queen anymore. Really, I don't know why. Dude, but. their burgers are fantastic, and the flamethrower is like, oh, we're gonna put like pepper jack cheese and then the spicy like Thousand Island on it. Yeah. So, I mean, you might be paying for it later, but you're gonna oh, yeah. love it. When the time comes to eat. <laughs> yeah, well, that's an excuse to get a blizzard with it, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hot eating a cool treat, you know. <laughs> uh, speaking of fast food, uh, so, guys, we were talking about how fast food, sometimes you go places and uh, it takes forever. The other day, I went to Dairy Queen. I was having, like, a little cheat day. So mm-hmm. I was like, I'm going to get a blizzard because it's my cheat day and I really want ice cream. And uh, I go there and I order a blizzard and I had to wait, like five six minutes in line there's like three or four cars in front of me and this guy's like man i'm really sorry about your weight here you go and he handed me like five coupons for free blizzards and i was like whoa there's an investment i know time investment yeah exactly so i was like wow now my cheat days are covered i get free blizzards anytime i want one thing i hate if you're in a dysfunctional customer service uh environment like a situation that just kind of rolls up on you like you know you walk and then you realize is the people in line, like, or the people waiting with you try to get you to form a, like, a tribe, like a hate <laughs> tribe against the people working and to, like, look at everything they do and be like, <laughs> oh, now, yeah. they're, now they're getting ketchup. Now they're getting nip, you know, like. Oh, yeah, it's about time. It's about time. Like, they, you know what I'm talking about? Like, they want this, uh, this cheer section of assholes and they try to. <laughs> I, I, I refuse to participate in that, man. I oh, really now do. you're going to drop fresh fries. Oh, yeah. I see how it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. right. Like, oh, he gets his food now. Oh, you know, like, yeah, the, I've been waiting here for five minutes, man. This guy uh, ordered after me, and he's already got his food. Yeah, he got his flamethrower. <laughs> yeah, he got his flamethrower. And it's like, well, yeah, dude, you're ordering like 15 designer items. Yeah. And this guy just ordered one thing that was probably sitting back there and not good. Yeah. But yeah, they do want to form that allegiance. Yeah, it's a dark allegiance, man. <laughs> like a relationship that lasts until you they, the main guy gets his food, and then it just falls apart. <laughs> then, but yeah, the disperses. <laughs> it was they, like the Bulls when uh, Jordan retired for a year. Yeah, they had Pippen, they had Longley, they had Rodman, but without Jordan, uh, just they were just barely a playoff team. They weren't going to Pete. They were not. Yeah. And so um, when I was a kid, I I was at a Taco. Remember when the Taco Bell was on 10th Street and Jeff, like where the CVS is, or there's a Rite Aid there now. 
and it was like old Taco Bell, the one that looked like the Haciendas. Oh, yeah. So I had this uh, friend, and his dad didn't give a shit about, like, anything, and he would just, like, drop us off places. So he drops off at the Taco Bell on 10th Street and just, like, left. And so we're in there. It was As a kid, it was awesome. Uh, but I remember there was, like, a truck driver. Like, his, his, like, big rig was outside, and we're sitting there eating, and he gets his food, and then, you know, he's like, oh, finally, motherfucker, you know, or whatever. Walks out kicks the door with his boot to like be dramatic a dramatic kick and he just shatters the glass like with his boot <laughs> and then just keeps walking and i mean my friend we stand up on our chairs we're like yeah and then the employees are like shut the fuck up you know we just sit back down and and uh enjoy our bel grande uh mexican pizza i, I don't know why i remember that but yeah <laughs> dude that's great speaking of uh uh people that would just don't give a shit and would just drop you off uh, my, my dad took me, my sister, <laughs> I'll never forget this. So I'm like, I'm, I'm probably three years old, maybe, uh, three or four, whenever Gremlins two came out guys, cause this is going to be the big thing in the story. So I'm, I'm like, you know, four years old. My sister is seven. Uh, and then like my cousin Ryan and his sister are a couple years older. So the oldest one of us is maybe nine. <laughs> you know, 10. Yeah. And uh, he takes us all to the movies, and uh, him and his girlfriend at the time uh, drop us off at the movie theater, uh, and we all go see Gremlins 2 together, except they leave and go see another 48 hours. <laughs> and uh, so, like, there's four of us, the oldest one being like 10, and we went and saw Gremlins 2. And it's like, have you ever seen four kids scared to death? <laughs> like, I mean, there's like this huge, like, spider gremlin and like yeah. all this stuff, and it was just like, uh, Super frightening experience, but yeah. Speaking of, <laughs> did your dad? He ran. Did he run for political office in Clarksville? He did. Did he win? No, he did not. Oh, okay. What did he run for? Um, I think something like a record, and maybe not recorder, but a city council. Okay, okay. Um, because I thought I've ever seen the signs. I think he put Diamond Dave on. He did on the signs. Okay, yeah. Shout out to Diamond Dave. <laughs> You'll get you him next him, year. You should give him a spot. <laughs> You'll get him next year. You should get him to sponsor the show. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Dad, uh, <laughs> can I borrow a few bucks? Would you like to uh, pledge a message of support? That's the way you should frame it. Exactly. <laughs> Would you like to uh, you know, contribute to a great cause <laughs> like your son's financial future? <laughs> but yeah. Uh, anyway, guys, uh, welcome back uh, here to the show. I've got Nick Dittmeyer sitting down with me. We are having a great time catching up here. Uh, and yeah, so basically where we left off um, before the break, we're talking about Nick getting into country music and how much we loved it here. And uh, also, guys, uh, I know I didn't mention it earlier, but Nick had a huge project, Slithering Beast, back in the day. Yeah, did you like that? The bass on the, yeah, sp- the spring of that mic stand. Yeah. It's going to make for great audio. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, Slithering Beast. Yeah. Dude, hit us with it. Uh, it was uh, a project I started in the in the bedroom at my parents' house when I was really depressed and when I was like 21 or 22 and I just started writing songs. Cause the thing about playing in bands, especially in heavy bands is that, um, you really need all the people there, you know, like, and a lot of the music is really specific, like, like country music or blues or like, even, you know, rockabilly or, or, or jazz, those types of music, like there's kind of a foundation Right. fit in like where if you're a good enough player within that genre you can kind of show up and f- you know fumble your way through or be really good at, you know there, there's kind of some rules with it but with heavier music it's harder because there aren't like type cast chord progressions you right know, in, in all of it so when i had personnel i had a lot of personnel problems and so i wanted to do something that like i could really rely on myself with because with because with country music or folk music or singer songwriter type stuff you can it, it can have several like versions of itself and still be pretty close like i can go out and play a solo show or like a duo show or a full band show or we can actually play full band and maybe strip things down a little bit and it's the same uh it, it you the audience will get oh jesus sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool guys we're just we're plucking a little bass guitar here <laughs> um it, it people will get the the point across of what the musicians are trying to do in heavier music. You can't like you can't do that, and that for me was really limiting. Um, yeah. And another reason why I really felt like the need to move on from a lot of heavy music was, um, you kind of like you're 21 or 22, and you're like, where are the older people? Like you know, like they kind of drop off, you know, right. and and um, 
I felt a need to like maybe do something that could set me up because I knew I wanted to keep playing music and I needed to kind of do something that I could do for the long haul. Um, right. Really. And so, uh, yeah, I did that for like six years. And then, um, the reason I got out of that was because like I was doing a lot of solo shows and, and trying to go out and tour more. And I think if you're gonna, and this was in my experience anyways, and this has stayed true pretty much, you know, the last few years is that if you want to go do a project, like it's probably best for you just to go do it and then try to get people to follow you to do it, you know? And then that's the proof that like, this is going to happen. Like this is happening. And the touring that I'm doing now, is kind of like out of that too, where like, I think there's a general nature f- for people to follow somebody maybe. Right. And for them to lay that foundation down of, of, and kind of set a precedent for the way things are going to be. Um, well, and also too, I mean, you're putting in all the work you're, you're doing, you're writing the songs, you're making it happen. And you know, even if there's no band, you're still making the shows happen. So yeah, there can be an appropriate medium to, to, to do that, you know? Um, so it's kind of a natural progression that from Slithering Beast, you just decided, Hey, I'm going to be Nick Dittmeyer. Yeah, and then was, I'm going to form my band. Yeah, and it was like I was doing a lot of solo, getting offered solo shows and, and other stuff too. And it was like, well, it's Nick Dittmeyer from Southern Beast. And it was like, it feels like a lot, a mouthful, you know, like to kind of explain to people where it was just better just to put my name on. So, like, the first EP I did was just Nick Dittmeyer. And then actually, the first two were just that. And then the, the way the Sawdusters kind of came out was I did start to have a permanent band of like guys. And it was um, the, the band that did the last full length. And so. We could, we were kind of just doing it under the name the Nick Dittmeyer band, but I wanted a Nick Dittmeyer and those. And so the Sawdusters was it was um, the bass player at the time's dad actually pitched that name, and uh, like it felt appropriate. Like we actually used to practice in a wood shop, um, right? It kind of has like a blue collar ethos to it, you know. Right. Um, it's digestible enough, but and I feel too, it's one of those things where when you hear Nick Dittmeyer and the Sawdusters, like you pretty much will. If you saw that on packaging or you saw it on a flyer, you you already have an idea in your head of what it is that you're going to get, what the contents of the package are. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's not it's not you know it wouldn't be if you were like Nick Dittmeyer and the Wolverines and like what is this <laughs> like some sort of uh, some howling? What is, this? <laughs> is this a rock and roll group or what is this? You know? Yeah. With Sawdusters, I think you know what you're going to get. Yeah, hopefully. You know? So, but yeah, I think that that I think that that's a good idea, and and it's one of those things too. You know, with Nick Dittmeyer and the Sawdusters, if you go and you play a show, it's just Nick Dittmeyer. People aren't going to be disappointed. You know, if you, it's yeah. like you go see Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers and it's just Tom Petty, you know, you'd, you'd be fine with it. But if you went to go see, or like Bruce Springsteen, the E Street Band, and yeah. it's just Bruce Springsteen, you'd be like, I'm cool with that. Yeah. But maybe if you go see like, you know, Motley Crue and it's just Nikki Six uh, strumming a bass guitar, you'd be like, man, this is lame. Yeah. You know, I would, yeah, I think so. <laughs> so there you go, you made it happen. Oh, oh man, dude, this microphone is really tripping you up, guys. It is, dude. This is like one of the things in podcasting, bro. You got to be, you got to be aware of your surroundings at all times. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, and the Sawdusters, man. I, I mean, you guys um, just are really doing big things. I, I just saw your record uh, out at Guest Room Records just the other day when I was over there. And where, where was it in the store? Uh, in the uh, section with uh, the local stuff and like Eastwood Records and all that good sort of thing. So oh, okay. But how did you guys? Uh, so you're putting out here. I, I just did it too. Uh, but you're putting out uh, music on Eastwood Records. Tell me about those guys because they seem like they're really doing a lot of cool stuff. How'd you get hooked up with them? Uh, w- with Wes, um, the guy that was playing drums in our band at the time actually had uh, a record deal uh, with Eastwood, and so what what they've done. So the the record had it come out in January, and then basically what they did is we contacted them about a vinyl release so they took over the vinyl um aspect of it and they took over all the cd inventory basically um so we are going to put part full-on partner with them for our new record but um it was basically the, the way that it came to be was we were just looking for a label that would that would be, was interested in doing it that release on vinyl is yeah how it came out so are you a vinyl uh collector at, at this point in your life yeah absolutely yeah, yeah me too um i like vinyl i mean i think Maybe its popularity is a little overblown, you know, and, um, but I personally like it. And then I like, you know, I like finding records that you are only going to get on vinyl. Like I actually went to guest room like Monday and they had this big shipment in from like a bunch of like bluegrass from some obscure, like East Tennessee label from like the sixties, you know? So, I mean, you can't, it's, you know, there's, there's new stuff available 
just ba- just based on that format alone. Yeah, and I agree. And plus, too, like uh, for me, I, I finally got into vinyl. At, at first, I was like, oh, vinyl, everybody likes it. I get mm-hmm. it. I was like, I have a laser disc collection, <laughs> you know. Forget forget uh, vinyl. I'm going next level. But I finally succumbed to the vinyl thing just because, you know, I, it's like, for one, it's just like all the music comes out digitally or like on vinyl anymore. And it's like I get so tired of, to me, digital music, I like it. It's convenient to listen to digital music, you know, when you're in your car and mm-hmm. like, or you got your headphones in or whatever. That's super convenient. But I don't want to buy something digitally. Like I have Spotify. I can just stream it, yeah. you know. So... When I want to buy something, I want something tangible. I want like something that I can hold in my hands, and I just like it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I like to see an album cover that's twelve inch, twelve inch by twelve inch, instead of you know just looking at a JPEG. Right. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And I think that's why vinyl has resurged so huge in like the last um, few years. It's just because people got tired of just like just having digital stuff. Yeah, you know, and you buy an album off iTunes, and then your phone resets, and then you got to go buy it again, mm-hmm. you know, or whatever. You get a new phone, you switch to Android. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go buy it again, you know. Yeah, well, and then, but I, I think in that same way, like people still do buy CDs. We actually sell CDs. Uh, yeah. Um, just, I mean, sometimes people just want, you know, to own something physical by the artist, in, right. in a way too. Um, Especially at a live show, it's the souvenir correct, that you yeah. get from seeing the show. Right, yeah. So, um, that's the way I, you know, the way we got to do 180 gram splash vinyl, you know, which is pretty cool. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't. I mean, the streaming's where it's at. I mean, Spotify right. is a good product. It's a good service. Um, the, and I have like the premium one too. And but the only thing is like I just think what is it like ten dollars for the premium or something? Or right, whatever. ten dollars a month. Yeah, it's just it's just too it's too cheap, man. You know, to pay anybody like for for, yeah. the, for royalty wise, it, it's just not enough. That it needs to cost more, and you know, and those companies too have lobbied Congress to pay even less royalties than what they're currently paying too. So it's like, um, you know, I'm all for it. I think it's awesome. I think it works, but they need to charge more for it. Yeah, I think uh, I read somewhere that, like, for your Spotify royalties, it, you get something like, and it, it's either point zero or point zero zero one six. So it's either like point zero one six or point zero zero one six of a cent yeah. per play. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look at the math because I knew we had a song that was on a like an official playlist like a southern rock playlist and so we were getting like you know like a thousand plays a day something like that and it it's never translated into very much money but actually we it it has helped pay for things while we've been on tour like some yeah, exactly. royalties. um but i mean if if that's the model we're gonna go to then i think then the 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 consumer is going to have to pay more. The, the, the product is just too good for $10. That's all right. I'm saying, you know? Yeah. See, that's what we had. Cause like, uh, we had like songwriting royalties and stuff. Like when you do your publishing or whatever, you get it all set up and I would get a check for like $200 every once in a while, you know, or 150 bucks every once in a while. Yeah. But yeah. So, but I do love Spotify and I'm Spotify. I have Spotify premium. So I'm all about it. <laughs> Sean versus wild is on Spotify guys. So don't act like I was talking down about it. I'm just saying I like to have, <laughs> Records. So, what's your what's your favorite record that you bought recently? Um, what do I listen to? I pull like I go through my collection. And I'll pull something out too that, uh, like maybe got kind of ignored, right, or, or something in the collection. Um, but I was listening to uh, Quicksilver Messenger. I think that was the last. I kind of had to bury it and then pulled out this Quicksilver Messenger record that that I like. But I've got some weird stuff too, like. Um, some, some weird records and like, I think the most valuable one I have is like a Rob, Rob Disney's Robin Hood. It's like a rare one that somebody gave, just gave me. Oh, that's cool. And then I looked it up and, uh, like it was like a, a rare pressing of this Disney soundtrack soundtrack. Yeah. Which it was, it's like my favorite Disney movie anyways, but yeah. And who's the guy that does the soundtrack too? Roger Miller. Roger Miller. Yep. Yeah. Can't roller skate in a Buffalo herd. Yep. Yeah, he's on my Sound advice, <laughs> <laughs> guys. Let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, what's uh, what's coming up on the horizon there for the Sawdusters? I know probably by the time that this podcast comes out, you will be on the road, mm-hmm. so you'll be able to listen to this podcast on the road. That'll be good. Uh, yeah. But what do you got coming up? Say like you know in June and beyond. 
Um, we're doing rush shows uh, to Colorado and then down through Texas and then coming home. And then uh, we just got some regional stuff, some festivals, and then we're going to Europe for a month. And then we're putting a record out. That's the plan. So October 12th is when the new record is going to come out. So what's the uh, – so you got a new record. It's coming out. It's October 12th. And uh, it's called All Damn Day. Yeah. You're telling me about. So what's the, what are some of the themes behind the record? Or wh- Have you already recorded it? Is it already in the can? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's done. It's not like we don't have the final masters of it, but all the tracking is done. And we've got some mixes that are not 100%, but pretty close. What can people expect from this record? <sighs> well, like, it's good. Uh, like, um, we went up to Indy and did it. Uh, we tracked for about eight months off and on. Um, with these two producers and in, 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 they have their own studio. And then uh, I didn't, like, it's kind of weird. Like, we didn't play a lot of these songs live, and some of them we haven't really even played live together out, some of these songs. Um, so it's been kind of a different process. Cause I, I used a studio drummer on it versus this normal Sawdusters drummer. And um, I didn't write the record. I didn't, like, sit down and write the record specifically, if that makes sense. Like a lot of these were songs that I had and I was like, well, I think this song is going to work. I was like, I think this song is going to work. I think, you know, and then they all kind of made sense collectively, you know, together. Um, but it, it wasn't, I mean, some of them, when I went in and started tracking, I was thinking, well, I might not use this song. Right. But you might as well just lay it down. Yeah. The thing is, is for me is, uh, and I'm sure you're probably this way too. Sometimes the songs that you're like, uh, I'll just, uh, we'll lay it down. We'll see how it turns out. And then some of those become like the big gems of the record. Yeah. Cause you're totally. like, Oh man, this is way better than I ever thought it was going to be. Yeah. And then some songs you're like, you, you think is maybe the strongest song on the record. And once you kind of get in and, and really hear it outside of your head, you know, it's not, um, doesn't have the pizzazz. Doesn't have the pizzazz. You yeah. know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's uh, floundering on the pizzazz. So yeah, well that's cool, man. And like, what is like again? What are some of the themes or whatever uh, in in your lyrics or anything uh, going on on this record? Um, a lot of death. Um, you know, um, well, re- way to really bring those people. <laughs> they're gonna love this, guys. It's all about death. Like I don't know. There's just been a lot of people, you know, over the last year to die. You know, um, that I've known. So it's some of that. You know. Um, and then writing wise, you know, uh, taking, you know, I do walk, you know, I walk and like try to train my mind to be observational, right? Um, to be aware of things. Um, Would you say this is a more personal record for you? Maybe, yeah. I think that that's probably accurate. Yeah, you know, I could do some words. I like, you know. Some words and songs that I don't, you know, normally. <laughs> I <laughs> dropped the word morel in like a morel mushroom ah, in nice. a song. Yeah, I've so. been dropping some mushrooms, dude, yeah. during the recording. <laughs> I couldn't remember it, brother. Well, that's awesome, man. I look forward to uh, to checking it out. And guys, uh, you definitely should too. That's going to be coming at you in October. You said you're going to go to Europe too, man. I got to backtrack, dude. What have you been to Europe yet? Mm-mm. Are you stoked or what? Yeah, yeah, we're going to be there for a month. It was an agency that came to us about it. Um, you know, so we've got, we we got it all go ready to go. And, um, it's just Belgium and the Netherlands, um, for, you know, that, and, and hopefully there'll be something we can go back and do, you know, over and over really. You know, so. I have some friends, uh, in the band quiet haulers. Um, yeah. I know guys, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And dude, they, they clean house in Europe. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think that the kind of the alt country, the folk music is, uh, is really hot, like really hot over there, mm-hmm. you know, especially in the clubs and stuff like that the the more american uh, americana sound so uh i hope you guys just kill it man i hope you drink uh huge beers out of a big glass shaped like a boot <laughs> do they have it oh yeah dude okay so did you see that in a movie or did no they... man like like beer league or beer fest or beer the fest. Oktoberfest in general <laughs> like you know you just you drink beer out of a stein or out of a glass boot okay i'll do it it just for me. I promise. <laughs> I'll, sit, I'll get a text at like, you know, 4.30 a.m. And it's just you with a boot <laughs> going up. Fantastic, dude. Well, uh, as we're winding down here, as we're riding off into the sunset, uh, where can people find Nick Dittmeyer and the Sawdusters on the internet? Um, on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, uh, Bandcamp. Um Anywhere music is sold. Anywhere you know? music is sold, brother. Yeah. If you want to go down to Best Buy... Or FYE, 
<laughs> you go ahead and get it there. Yeah, yeah. No, does that is, is that the I'm thing sh- still? I don't or? even. Uh, Best Buy. I don't even know if they carry CDs anymore. Okay. My favorite as a kid, I always used to get CDs at Circuit City. Yeah, they they actually had the deals at Circuit City. Yeah, because you oh. could get a CD there for like seven dollars, or most yeah. of them were like nine ninety nine. And like the most expensive ones were like twelve ninety nine. Yeah, because if you went to like a Sam Goody or what, or yeah. disc jockey, who was yeah, I'm, I'm going to Camelot Music. Camelot Music, yeah. <laughs> How much is this CD? It's forty five dollars. Yeah, dude, it was expensive there. No wonder they went out of business. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and you should yeah. price gouging like that to the children. <laughs> They're just trying to get their uh, Metallica records. Yeah, live throwing copper. That's yeah, dude. We're trying to, we're trying to get load and reload. Yeah, over here, dude. Do you believe? The theater that the, that it was supposed to be a double album, or I think that was just like a lie. And Metallica told people, dude, if it was a double album, like fine, but I don't know. It, it just seems like it was to me. It was like just, I, when the eighties bands that I love so much, it, the the nineties were such a hard time for them because they wanted so much to be like, oh, dude, we'll be like Nine Inch Nails, or we'll be like kind of industrial, or we'll be kind of like the alternative rock or whatever. And I think Load and Reload are like fine. Um, I think that they would be held in lower regard had Metallica not put out dog shit for the rest of their career. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But so. it's like I went and revisited, was rewatching Some Kind of Monster a couple months ago, and it's like these that are so like... so good. Mil- oh, dude, it's a great movie. And it's like these millionaire middle-aged guys who have everything that are trying to make like totally angry music and it, and it's just like painful to watch them they just don't have it in them man you know and like it just doesn't look fun they argue about hawaiian shirts and yeah hawaiian shirts and their 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 therapist is in their writing sessions it's like dude just, just dude, stop like the part where <laughs> lars ulrich is screaming frantic tick 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 talk and then screams talk at the end i get so embarrassed secondhand like i can't deal with it and yeah. there's a lot of cringeworthy parts in some kind of monster guys if you haven't watched it uh go back and check it out and like he's like painting these like elaborate paintings oh, that like aren't that great and it's weird lars's dad the old man father time looking guy yeah they're like no but you know father it, claus yeah <laughs> he's like lars this is not a good heavy metal <laughs> <laughs> exactly but uh, and then but actually i thought jason newstead like looked like the most sane member of all of them, but he's the guy that fucking quit. You yeah, know, like, probably because he was the most sane. Yeah, member he was like, dude, he made, you know, he made so much money off the band. It's like, dude, fuck all this, like, you know, anymore. There's got to be a point though with music that of walking away. It's almost like shows that like you really like that go on for too long, right? Like Parks and Rec or something like that. And you're just like, dude, you could, you know, because people get sad about certain shows that are canceled, like Freaks and Geeks or you know something. But it's like, yeah, but the like the brevity of that. Is what makes it special. Is what makes it special. The fact that they don't... It's not like How I Met Your Mother. Yeah. They make like 14 seasons of it, and they don't... The whole plot of the show is in the title, and they just ditch it. You know? Right, like, yeah. You know? Um, Dude, um, the the biggest thing for me was like, I used to watch Community all the time. Okay. And like, Community um, was like... It was on TV, and then it got canceled, and then like, uh, I think Hulu or somebody picked it up, and then it got canceled again... And then it like went to like Yahoo, like <laughs> Yahoo, like did some sort of service, and by the end of it, it was just like so shitty, and like you couldn't get it because they it was, still like, Chevy Chase doing it. No, oh. like everybody, most people had already left. Who, who was couple, still on it? Like the Indian I think guy. that uh, I think no, I think basically it was like Britta and uh, so like the girl with the blonde hair mm-hmm. and then Joe McHale, the main character. Oh, uh, wow. Maybe yeah. I don't even know. But well, isn't a community college supposed to be a short time anyways, you know, like yeah. two year degree? <laughs> exactly. How many seasons are we going to milk out of this? Right, exactly. Yeah. So, but yeah, the ones that just keep going on and on. Or like, uh, imagine like a show like Family Matters. Like it used to just be a show about Carl Winslow's family. And then by the end of it, it's like Steve Urkel's turning into Stefan Urkel oh, yeah. and marrying Laura at Disney World. And Is that what happened in the show? Yes. Okay. And yeah. then like they, you know, shrink Carl to like the size of like, you know, Whatever, like these are real episodes. Like it started out as like a working man's like yeah Cosby or yeah, something, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Totally. And then it turned into like oh, me and Steve are on this on the smooth juice, and then we're turning into Stefan or Kel, you know, or whatever. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I remember he would get in a, in a machine. <laughs> yes, he would. Yeah, and turn cool. Yeah, because I remember, I was reading an interview with Jill Jill wasn't Jill White Jill White and look, there's an AV Club article and like. 
I don't think he even tries anymore. Like, I think he just quit acting. He was like, dude, I'm the most successful black child actor of all time. He's like, I don't even care. Yeah. yeah. Why would you? Like, yeah. he probably just lives off of his millions. Yeah. And uh, laughs all the way to the bank. Yeah. I mean, because you can get the point of popular, whether it's a sitcom or like almost like um, Macaulay Culkin or something like that, where, you know, you can get to the point where you're just so successful at one thing in a show to the point where you can't really deal with anything else. You'll just be known as like that guy from that thing. Right. You know? Exactly. If I were Jalil White, it'd be like, dude, Jalil, did you just buy another Ferrari? And I would just be like, <laughs> did I do that? <laughs> you know, yeah. got any cheese? <laughs> got any cheese? <laughs> yeah. Um, but man, there's, yeah. Yeah. Fucking family matters. Yeah. yeah, dude. That's what it's all about. Family matters. And let that be a lesson to everybody. Family matters. So, Make sure you hug your loved ones and okay. uh, all that good sort of thing. But yeah, let's go ahead and get out of here before we overstay our welcome, before we go into our smooth juice, Stefan Arkell seasons of the podcast. Guys, if you like what you heard today, definitely check out Nick Dittmeyer and the Sawdusters online. They're everywhere and anywhere music is sold. And then also you can uh, check out my podcast, SeanVersusWild.com. It is also on Spotify. It's on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, wherever you enjoy your podcasts, it will be there. So, Nick, it's great catching up with you, brother. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for being on the show, guys. Thanks for listening. And this has been the Sean vs. Wild podcast. for listening, D-N-N.